disclaimer. So for everybody on the floor, everybody in the balcony, everybody watching at home, like we're all Christians, or if you're not a Christian, Jesus is going to come to your life today. It's going to change your life. But I've got to give this disclaimer, uh, and as Christians, you're going to have to forgive me. You're going to have to extend grace to me. And the disclaimer is this, is that this morning, over the next few minutes, I'm going to have an equal opportunity sermon here. It is guaranteed to offend uh, pretty much everybody. So, <laughs> so... Uh, you know, if you're, uh, if, if you're ready to go, look around in your seat for that seat belt, buckle it up. I hope you wore two pairs of socks. That first pair of socks is about to get shot right off. Um, my, grandfather, my grandfather used to say that he knew that the Sunday morning message was for him when he could feel his toes curling in his shoes. And I just have a suspicion that some toes are going to curl over the next few minutes. Not because I'm intentionally trying to poke you, but I would just ask you to give a little bit of grace. That might be the Holy Spirit trying to shake your cage a little bit as we talk about holy risk. As we talk about holy risk. And as we get into this topic, I just have to share like a pet peeve. I mean, everybody's got pet peeves. Everybody has these little irritations in their life that just crawl under their skin. And I have to tell you, I've got a pet peeve, and Pastor Nick actually set this up a couple weeks ago when he talked about words and phrases that we've used over the last 12 months that we've never had to formulate in our mouth and shoot them out before. Words like social distancing and words like in an abundance of caution. But the one word that just drives me crazy, and I'm trying to actually eliminate it from my verbal lexicon is this word, safe. I just don't like the word. The word drives me crazy. The word safe. Because here's the deal. Despite warning labels, we still use all kinds of products. Despite warning labels, people are still putting Gorilla Glue in their hair. (laughs) But you know what's funny? That didn't exist on the warning label. Oh, buddy, they're printing labels this week. (laughs) Despite the stats, we still drive our cars. I mean, can you just imagine if you were to go back in time 200 years and talk to like the early settlers of Pennsylvania and say, at some point in the future, we're going to get in these metal machines and we're going to drive at 60 miles an hour. They'd be like, what? Are you crazy? Are you insane? Oh yeah, it gets even better than that. We're going to get in this big, long metal tube and we're going to go up a mile above planet earth and go from one point to another. That just, it doesn't make sense. And a lot of things that are about safety just really don't make sense. In fact, A lot of things about safety would communicate to us that we use wisdom, but sometimes wisdom and safety don't go hand in hand, and certainly boldness and wisdom and safety almost don't belong in the same sentence. But despite the dangers, we still brave the winters. We still do these things. We still do things every day in our life, taking risks every single day. Every single day that you are breathing, that you are inhaling and exhaling, you are taking risks to get from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. You're taking risks all the time. All the time we take risks. We come to peace with certain risks to the point where we don't even think about them anymore. And now, more so than ever, here's what I think is happening, is that as a culture and as a society, we've become addicted to safety. It's become kind of a a, a drug in our life that we have to be safe all the time. I'm actually going to call us over the next few minutes to not be safe anymore. And I know some toes are curling on that. You're like, where is this guy going? Just give me a moment. Just give me a moment. The other day, I was in a restaurant drive through and I was ordering my, uh, my, my food. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to tell you the name of the restaurant, but I was ordering my food, and they make good tacos. And so I ordered at the little talk box. I drove around to the window, and they said, your, your total is $4.52. I said, no problem. Shabam, MasterCard, here you go. And as I go to hand it, the, the employee behind, you know, the bulletproof proof, uh, you know, plexiglass hands out a bucket, an empty bucket. I was like, huh, Okay. She's wearing gloves. She hands out an empty bucket. So I drop my card in the bucket. She brings the bucket inside, gets my card out of the bucket, swipes the card, puts it back in the bucket, and gives it back to me. And I could not help myself. I just said, people, 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 people. What are we doing here? What are we doing? I get that there's wisdom, but this is ridiculous. Like, there's just points. There's got to be a line somewhere where out of an abundance of caution, out of safety, we're actually doing things that just really don't make sense. 
And in our walk with Jesus, sometimes this happens. And that's what I want to push against this morning as we talk about holy risk. Because how can we, as people who are followers of Jesus, who are part of the family of God, how can we live in a way that is uniquely different than the world around us? In fact, the call in the scriptures, Old Testament to New Testament, is anytime God invites you to come into his family, he invites you to come out of a way of living and into a new reality to live uniquely different than the people around you so that you can be a light to the people that God has put around you. We are called to be people who are uniquely different. But what does uniquely different look like? How can we risk? How can we live in a a place in our life where we're not addicted to safety? We still balance that with wisdom. But how do we risk without fear? And that's why I love the name of this series, Holy Risk. I love that we sang about God being holy. It's a powerful word. Holy is, is, is God is set apart. He's different than. He's greater than. There's nothing comparable to him. Holy is this idea of elevated and different above everything else. That's who God is. And when we take risks as followers of Jesus, we're not taking careless risks. We're taking calculated risks because our risk is holy. It's set in God. It's not set in the things around us. We do things sometimes that make no logical sense because we trust God and not the system of this world. We take a holy risk, a set-apart risk, a different risk. So I want to tell you a story from the scriptures that's a different risk. In fact, as you read through this story, if you've ever read this before, you kind of scratch your head a little bit and go, what was Paul thinking? I mean, come on, have you ever read through the text and just thought, like, what were they thinking? What a crazy idea. Why would they do that? In the city of Ephesus in 60 AD, it was a very important city. It was the most prominent city in the Roman government in the province of Asia, a population of about quarter to a half a million people, luxury living. They had indoor plumbing. I mean, that's a pretty remarkable thing for the first century. They had all kinds of arts and entertainment. There was all kinds of things to do and and places to go and people to see. And and within the city of Ephesus, as, as important as it was, it was so grand. Everything there was grand. In fact, one of the largest marble structures in the world was there, and it was the temple to the goddess Artemis, the goddess Artemis, or also called Diana. And in Ephesus, this was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that people would travel from all over the world to come and see. And so surrounding this temple would be all kinds of shops. I mean, you can just imagine if there's something cool to see, there's going to be a Holiday Inn like right there, right? And they're going to build a Bob Evans and they're going to build all these things around because there's this increase in tourism. And so Ephesus was this hub in the Roman government that people would come through. It was a trade city. It was on the sea and and there there were all kinds of uh, business and commerce was happening through the city of Ephesus. So it's no wonder that the Apostle Paul, after he has this amazing encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, spends several years of his life in Ephesus. Why? It's an influential city that reaches out to the ends of the earth and he strategically is going to communicate the gospel of Jesus in Ephesus. It's really kind of remarkable how he does this. And after he's there for a while, his, his intense teaching and preaching of, of the way of Jesus, or, or Christians as they were called at that time, was the way. His teaching is having such a profound influence. Look at Acts chapter 19, verses 19 and 20. This is the difference that the gospel of Jesus will make in a city, right? Like, what if this was to happen to us? Look at Acts chapter 19, verses 19 and 20. It says this, A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. And look at this last part. So the message of the Lord spread widely and had powerful effect. What would it look like if we had an economy-wrecking message of Jesus? And I'm not just talking about like restaurants and things like that, but what if like the adult film store could not stay in business because there's just too many followers of Jesus, that the gospel had such an impact that evil couldn't even live there. It would just die a quick death because the gospel of Jesus is bringing life to people in that area. What would that look like? And that's what's happening here in Ephesus is that the gospel of Jesus is being preached so much so people are coming to faith in Jesus and they're giving up their way of life. They're not going to the temple of Artemis. They're not going to buy all these shrines and these handmade gods. And of course, what that's going to do is it's going to shake some cages. It's going to bother people. 
I mean, you start messing with somebody's pocketbook, I mean, they're okay to talk to you about Jesus, but the minute you say, hey, this is going to cost you something, it's a whole different ballgame. And so at that time, like the local like chamber of commerce is getting together and it's being led by this guy named Demetrius. And we're going to read about him in just a second, but he is going to gather people together because he's feeling a hit in his pocketbook. His livelihood has been threatened by the gospel of Jesus. He's got employees, he's got workers and all this other stuff, and he can't pay them anymore because his funds are so low because nobody's buying their idols because the gospel of Jesus is going forward. It's absolutely incredible. So check this out in Acts chapter 19, verses 24 to 28. This is a little bit of the story, and I'm going to read this chunk of scripture because you have to understand how intense this moment was. This is about the riot in Ephesus. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith. He had a large business manufacturing silver shrines to the Greek goddess Artemis. He'd make these little tchotchkes that people could take home and worship these little shrines. And he kept many craftsmen busy. He had a lot of employees. Verse 25, he called them all together along with other uh, people employed in similar trades and he addressed them as follows. He says, gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods are not gods at all. And he's done that not only here in Ephesus, this is great, right? It's not just here, he's wrecking the economy of the whole Roman government. But throughout the entire province. Now go down to verse 28. At this point, their anger boiled. Look, here's this guy. He's coming in. You know, he's wrecking your retirement income, you know, with this message of Jesus. Are you just going to sit around and take it? Their anger boiled. They begin shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And like, uh, uh, they start chanting. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we got to do something about this. And you can just feel the tension rising in the air. In verse 29, soon the whole city was filled with confusion. And everyone rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Erasticus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So you see here Demetrius, he's getting hit in the pocketbook, and he starts gathering people around him. See, misery loves company, right? Misery loves company. So he starts gathering a posse. You don't see a lot of posse gathering anymore. Well, you kind of do. But they turn into riots and destruction. And so this is what he's doing. He's inciting a riot. And we've seen some of this in our culture lately where people are gathered together and, and, and they're, they're upset and they're angry. And I'm not discounting the fact that some people are going to be upset and angry, okay? That's not what this is about. I'm just saying that in this moment, your intensity and your anger, it, it's seething over to the point where you can't even think straight. And they begin to gather together in the Ephesian amphitheater and they're chanting and they're angry and they, honestly, they want Paul's head. They want this guy out. They want this guy gone. Paul is bad for business. Jesus was the same way, right? Whenever Jesus walked into a city, Jesus was bad for business, especially any business dedicated to a false God. So I'm, man, I'm just praying that Jesus would come in and every false god, everything that is of the enemy, every business that makes dollars based off the scheme of the enemy would just like fall at the feet of Jesus. That would be so awesome. And so what would this look like? What would this look like? Now, I just want to share a couple of thoughts here. And this is where it might get weird. And as we talk about risk, I got to admit, like I've kind of sweated this message a little bit. And I'm sweating a little bit now. Because this is the point, if you're taking notes, you can just write in the margin, this is where it gets awkward. (laughs) And that's this. Your friends will either influence your faith or your fears. Demetrius shows up and he starts to rouse this crowd to anger. But specifically in the text, it says this, that most people didn't even know why they were angry. There's just confusion going on. And right now in our culture, we are constantly bombarded with noise. Noise from the news, noise from social media, noise from the medical community, noise from the commentators, noise from the politicians. Every side on every issue is spewing noise, noise, noise. And here's the the hard part about it, is that every one of them are demanding that they are right. They are demanding 100% alignment, 100% allegiance, 100% loyalty, or you're toast. There is constant noise going on around you. But the reality is this. Your friends will either influence your faith or your fears. And right now, Demetrius is influencing this riot to come against Paul and the followers of Jesus part of the way in Ephesus. 
Because there's a few groups of people that are taking place here. We've got this large group of people that are making noise, this large crowd. They're angry and they're rioting. I mean, this is interesting how close we are to the world of the scriptures. So anytime somebody says, oh, like the Bible, that's like way back then and that's ancient and archaic. Look, we're seeing it lived out now. We're seeing it lived out right now. So many people confused. They're just going along with the crowd. They're not even sure what they're doing. They're giving in to their emotions. They're not thinking rationally. And the next thing you know, everybody is an enemy of everybody else. So you have the large crowd they're writing, but then you have this small crowd around Paul. And I want to talk about this small crowd because, see, it's important who you surround yourself with. It's important the noise that you allow into your life, right? Like, and there's a really easy solution for all that garbage. Like, turn it off. Like, just to stop. You're like, are you saying just, like, stop? That's what I'm saying. Just, just stop. You know, it's Lent. It's a good time for fasting. Some of us need to just fast outside noise and just bathe yourself in some scripture. It's like fast the noise. The noise will wait. The noise will always be there. Get perspective from the Lord. Get in God's word. Okay, that's just a small aside. But here's the small crowd around Paul, right? So here you have to imagine this crowd is, is chanting and they're foaming and they're angry. And in Acts chapter 19, verse 30, here's what's really crazy. They're all rioting. They're screaming. They're loud. They've rushed into the amphitheater, which I'm going to show you a picture of in just a moment. But in Acts chapter 19, verse 30, this is Paul's response, right? They want Paul dead, And this is his response, Acts 19, verse 30. Paul wanted to go in, but the believers wouldn't let him. Some of the officials of the province and friends of Paul, they also sent a message to him, begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Paul wanted to go in. What did Paul want to go into? Show that picture. This is the Ephesian amphitheater that's been excavated. Seats 25,000 people. It seats more people than the PPG arena in Pittsburgh. Can you just imagine the arena filled with rioters screaming, we want Paul dead, great as Artemis, ah, and you know if you go in there, you're gone. And what is Paul's response? Paul's response is he wants to go in there. Listen, if you were around in that moment, if you were a companion of Paul, if you were a follower of Jesus, you're part of the way, Paul is maybe your teacher, and they're, they're screaming, for, and Paul's like, you know what, guys, I'm going in there. Like, homie is whack. Like, I don't think Paul got enough sleep. I think he's a little crazy. Paul, why don't you just hang out? But they, they restrain Paul. He's, he's getting ready to go in there. What are you doing, Paul? Don't you see the risk? Don't you see the danger? Don't you see the news? Don't you see the reports? Don't you see the statistical lines, how they go like this? Don't you see all that fact? Don't you see all that information? Why would you do something so careless? Why would you do something so foolish? Are you crazy? And what does Paul want to do? He wants to go in there. You know, I could be wrong, but as I read throughout the New Testament, it seems to me like most of Paul's life was doing what seemed to be uh, dangerous things and making unwise choices, making choices that would get him into danger, that would get him into trouble. I mean, we know this, right? I mean, he's shipwrecked, he's beaten, he's bit with snakes, he's, he's uh, flogged, he's you know, thrown out of town, he's imprisoned, he's handcuffed to guards so he won't get out and preach the gospel of Jesus. I mean, like, you know, Paul, all of this would go away if you just like zip the lip. They could all go away. Why would you do that? Why would you make these unwise choices? Why would you take this? Why would you do things, Paul, that are not safe? Why would you do that? It's not safe. And I'm sure you've had people around you as well saying, look, you need to do this because that's not safe. You need to do that because that's not safe. And look, I'm not here necessarily to be the Holy Spirit. But there's, t- there, there's just times where we have an idol of safety that like the people in Ephesus We need to burn it and say there's more to this life than my breathing. There's more to this life than my health. So what is Paul doing here in this moment? What's what's going through his brain? And here's what I would say is where others saw opposition, Paul saw opportunity. 
Where other people saw opposition, Paul saw opportunity. Paul would use any opportunity available to preach the message of Jesus, to be bold about the message of Jesus. And look, there is absolutely a time that you need to listen to those around you who love Jesus, who love you, who care about you, who understand, look, this risk, maybe not now. This isn't the time. Because there is obviously in this moment, Paul held back. He let his friends influence him and he held back, but he would not be held back forever. There is a time to hold back and be wise, but then there is a time to charge forward and be bold because eternity is on the line. So they held him back for just a moment. So allow me to just kind of lovingly burst a bubble. How many of you okay with that? You're just like, burst the bubble. All right, if you want me to burst the bubble, just say, burst the bubble. Okay, there we go. All right, here's the, here's the bubble that's going to be burst. Nothing in your journey with Jesus is safe. Nothing. Is it safe for a couple in their 60s to be like, you know what's a great idea? Instead of like retiring and buying a boat, yeah, let's go to the Dominican Republic and work with our bare hands, mixing concrete and building houses. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, all right. Nothing in your journey with Jesus is safe. Nothing. Everything is a risk. Think about that. Just making a confession of faith in the Lord Jesus is a risk. Perhaps not as much so for us, but our brothers and sisters in Christ in Muslim nations, they make a confession of Jesus. Everything is on the line. Do you think praying for people is like safe? That's risky. You're praying in faith. You think like tithing is safe? You ever tried to tell somebody who's not a follower of Jesus that you tithe? They look at you weird. Like, what are you doing? You know, you could buy that boat. Eh, yeah, well, there's bigger things at play than a boat. There's bigger things at play than my health. Like, I'm just kind of done being safe. The future belongs to the bold. Does that mean we're careless? Not necessarily. Some things that we do as followers of Jesus are going to seem absolutely reckless and careless and downright stupid to the world around us. There is times that God is going to ask you to do something out of sheer boldness. But your boldness is going to be the breakthrough for somebody else. Your boldness in giving and serving and living out Jesus, your boldness to stand strong in your faith in Jesus is going to be somebody else's breakthrough. Nothing is safe. Because here's the deal. Friends, we just need to come to peace with risk. We just have to come to peace with it. It's not safe. It's not. In fact, this might actually be a great time to laugh because there have been times where God has asked my wife and I to do stuff and we're like, ooh, I don't know how we're going to pay this bill. I don't know how we're going to do this. I, I, I don't know all the details. I just know that God has asked me to step out in faith and trust him and take like a holy risk and just trust God with the results and see how it goes. I need to come to peace with risk. Paul came to peace with this. Paul came to peace with this fact that there is more to life than my health. There's more. Because here's the deal. If we consider only our safety in sharing the gospel, the gospel will never be shared. If we consider only our safety in sharing the gospel of Jesus, then the gospel will never be shared. It is not safe. Let me burst that bubble. Nothing in your relationship with Jesus is safe. If Jesus hasn't asked you to do something that makes your toes curl a little bit, I'm just saying, are you following the right Jesus? Because there is times he is going to ask you to do things that seem absolutely insane. And it's so worth it. It's absolutely worth it. And you say, well, yeah, but Pastor Pete, I mean, what if this happens? Or what if, like, that happens? Or what? Yeah, it it might. It might. See, faith doesn't deny reality. Faith looks at reality as it is and says, but my God is greater. Faith looks at reality as it is. Yes, there's a pandemic out there, but my God is stronger. Faith looks at reality and says, man, I just don't know how this is going to happen. And says, yes, but my God will provide all my needs according to his riches and glory. Faith doesn't deny reality. 
Faith looks reality dead in the eye and speaks the name of Jesus. In fact, this is what Paul's going to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 8 through 11. This is great. Some of you, this is like homework assignment this week. You have got to memorize this verse, especially if you're in a place where you're paralyzed by fear because of the voices around you that are telling you to live in fear, okay? Here's this, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. This is Paul reflecting back on his time in Ephesus. He says this, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia, just very casually. I think you ought to know about this. It was a little bit of trouble. 25,000 people want me dead. They're chanting, they're screaming. Ah, Let me just tell you a little bit about it. And he says this, we were crushed, ouch, and we were overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought that we would never live through it. We thought in our own mind, this is the end. This is it. We're done. We're toast. We've come to the end of the race. We thought we would never live through it. In fact, in verse 9, in fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God. In spite of the reality that they wanted us dead, we decided in that moment, we made a decision. And some of you just need to make a decision to risk it all on Jesus and say, in this moment, I'm looking at reality as it is, but my God will still come through. I'm looking at the situation exactly as it is, but my God is stronger. My God is faithful. My God is good. Some of you, your God is too safe. Your God is too safe. And God will take you places and you're like, I can't believe that I'm here. And God will speak back to you. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made strong in your weakness. And Paul says, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and relied on God. Now, he could have stopped there, but he says this, we relied on God who raises the dead. What is Paul saying? Even if they killed me, my God can raise the dead. What you gonna do now? No matter what, even if they, I mean, what's like the worst that's gonna happen? You're gonna die? Look, burst another bubble, okay? I'm no scientist, per se, but the mortality rate for humans is still somewhere around like 100%. It gonna happen. And Paul says, look, I expected to die, but we started to rely on God. And we relied on God to the point that even if they killed us, God could raise us. Whoa. Like that will make it awkward in the lunchroom. Start risking on God. Some of you are just living paranoid in this fear of what might be. Look, I just, you're scaring the children. Okay? Like you're, they're watching, you're scaring the children. Cool it. Rely on God. Like, have you forgotten? Like, let me just kind of lovingly help you here. If this same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. Verse 10. This is so cool. Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. And he did rescue us. Paul. Oh. God came through, and he will rescue us again. I love that. I've seen you do it before, and I'll see you do it again. I've seen God be faithful here. I can see God be faithful there. We've sung it here before. I've seen you move. You move the mountains, and I believe that you'll do it again. Are we just like blowing words into the air, or do we actually believe it? Are we going to put a little bit of risk behind that? Are we going to just like sit on our biscuit, never having to risk it? Look, I want to risk it all for Jesus, because even if it costs me my life, like who cares? He can raise the dead. We're people of eternal resurrection anyway. We've got like nothing to lose. But I get it, that's going to come across as careless. And I'm not saying don't use wisdom. I'm not an advocate for not using wisdom. I'm just saying at some points, there are things that we're going to do in our walk with Jesus that are not wise, but they're godly. They're not wise, but they're godly. See, the people who surround you and pray with you and believe you, they will push you forward or they will move you backwards. You can have great risk and you can have great safety but you cannot have both. You can have great risk and you can have great safety, but you cannot have both. So what are those voices telling you? They're like, 
Pastor Pete's got voices in his head. What to, you know, cut the voices out, listen to the voice of Jesus. All right, second thought, we're going to move through this one pretty quickly. What moves your heart will move your feet. What moves your heart will move your feet. Like, I mean, we can obviously see what's moving the heart of our friends who shared this morning. What's moving their heart is building homes for, for families in the Dominican Republic. And what is that doing? It translates from the heart to the feet. And they're putting feet to that faith because it moves their heart. And so I'm going to be just a little bit more bold here, okay? This is where, again, you can do hashtag awkward for just a moment. The body of Christ is the most necessary of all essential services that exist right now. Notice I did not say the pastor. I did not say the building. I did not say the ministry strategy. I said the body of Christ is the most necessary of all essential services in the world right now. And the worst thing that we can do in engaging with our culture and sharing the good news of Jesus, especially in a pandemic world, is to do nothing. The worst thing we can do is nothing. Man, I tell you what, there are things that I regret in my journey with Jesus. And the things that I regret are not the risks that I stood on. They're not the risks that I ran into. It was the times when I could have risked and I stopped. The times where I could have been bold and I didn't. God's messing with me about something this morning and I'm like, wow, that's a big risk. I don't know, God. Like, do I trust you, Lord? Because faith is risk and risk is trust. Do I trust God? And if that's the case, will my God not come through? If fear moves your heart, it will stop your feet. But if faith moves your heart, it'll change destinies. See, here's the fact. Heroes don't run. They risk. I mean, this is true, right? We see this all the time. We see this not only in the movies, but we see this with our local police and firefighters and and medical personnel. Heroes don't run away. Like when there's danger, they run towards the danger. Why do we uh, call our healthcare workers like heroes right now? Because they're putting their own health at risk to help others get healthier, like, think about firefighters for just a minute, right? Our local firefighters. Like, this is how, how, how crazy this can seem on the outside. Like, when there is a building on fire, the, the, the natural response in the flesh is to run away from it. And what are they doing? They're running into it. It's not wise to run into a burning building. But they do it. Why? Why do they do this? Why do they risk their life? Because heroes know that a life saved is better than a life lost. That it's worth the risk for me to go in and try and do something to, than to lose everything and sit back and just watch it burn. And I'm, look, I'm just not going to sit back and watch things burn anymore. Like, I'm going to share Jesus. I'm going to bless people as often as I can. I'm going to do things that are going to make no sense to the world around you. And look, I'm not like in the place where I care a whole lot about what people think anymore about that. I'm going to trust Jesus And you say, uh, Pastor Pete, are you advocating for carelessness? No, I'm advocating for selflessness. For selflessness. That's what makes you bold. That is what is going to make you risk, is when you realize Jesus conquered the grave. What else do I have to fear? I mean, Jesus even said, like, hey, don't be afraid of those who can hurt, like, flesh and blood. Don't be afraid of those who can break your bones. You should be afraid of God in heaven, right? Like, because this is God, the eternal, transcendent creator of the world and everything as we know it. And, like, that should cause an incredible amount of fear and reverence. But it doesn't because God says you can now enter boldly into my presence. We have a boldness when we approach God. Why can't we have a boldness when we approach this world? I'm advocating for selflessness. See, this is why Paul ran back into the amphitheater. I'm going to invite the band to join me. We're going to close with a song, a declaration of faith here in just a moment. This is why Paul ran back into the amphitheater. Because people who are far from God are worth running towards. Think about this. In the amphitheater, there's 25,000 people who are in there screaming and rioting. And Paul saw that as an opportunity to share the message of Jesus. It's a pretty good estimate that there is 25,000 people in our zip code right now who do not know Jesus. God, would you move my heart and let it translate to moving my feet. I don't want to just feel it. I want to do something about it. I don't want to just experience you and then sit back and do nothing. I want to see Jesus in all of his fullness. And here's what I am convinced of. If we are always risking, we will always be rejoicing. 
Like if we're always risking, we will always be rejoicing. Why? Because we're risking on God. We're listening to him. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us about what our next step ought to be, about what we should do, about how we can be bold with the people around us, about what we can do to lift up the name of Jesus in the zip code for the 25,000 people who are far from God. Move my heart, God, and let it move my feet. Perhaps some of you need to pray a bold prayer this morning and say, God, there's been an idol of safety in my life and I've been hiding away in my bunker storing food and ammo for what might happen. Or God, I have this idol of safety. I'm wearing 19 masks and you know, like, I I don't know what to do. There's just all kinds of panic in this pandemic and I get that. And I'm not advocating for carelessness, but for selflessness. And what will that look like? And God, what is it that needs to fall in my life so that boldness can rise up? See, faith, when it's activated, translates into boldness and God is going to honor that because God responds to faith I just try it let me say it a little louder for the people in the back God responds to faith God is going to bless you for your faith of, of, of letting what's in your heart translate to your feet and going to the Dominican Republic you prayed for strength you are going to get that strength God is going to give you the strength of your 20s and the dreams of your teens I believe God gave me that for you You're going to get the strength of your 20s and the dreams of your teens. You see incredible things, incredible stuff. And God's going to use you. Don't you want to be used by God? Like, I don't want to sit on the bench anymore. Put me on the line. I don't care if I get tackled by a linebacker. I'm going to get back up and trust God because the game is happening. And I don't want to sit on the bench pretending I'm part of the team because I got the jersey on, but there's no grass. No grass stains on me. God, you can use me. So I'll give you this before we sing. John chapter 14, verse 27. This is Jesus, and he says, I am leaving you with a gift. How many of you want a gift this morning? God, give me a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give you is a gift that the world can't give. Some of us are just looking for peace in all the wrong places. That's like an old country music song, right? I'm looking for love in all the wrong places. Some of you are looking for peace in all the wrong places. Turn off the noise. Surround yourself with people who love Jesus, who love you. Be bold. Ask the Holy Spirit here in a moment as we sing, what boldness needs to rise up in my life? What idol of safety have I been keeping on that's been stopping you from working through me as effectively as you could? Would you stand with me this morning? Jesus said, so don't be troubled and don't be afraid. God is going to call us to do something that is going to make no sense. Like walking on water makes no sense. But if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. So let's align our faith for just a moment. Let's sing this out and then we'll come back and close.